Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you buy 2020 edition and always make sure that the book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll work on some problem that you will find on page number 472. Today is our day number 15, page 472, the very first problem that you see there, problem number 10. Let's, go, let's get going, shall we? If at the end of the video you find that it was helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can get hold of me by sending me an email at Keshwani Prep, that's P R E P Keshwani Prep, at iCloud.com or by simply visiting my website, KeshwaniPrep.com. Number 10. As I said already, make sure the book is in front of you because I'm not going to write down the entire problem on the blackboard. Here's, here, here's the gist of it. Number 10. We are surveying some students. We are told, we are told that some students were surveyed. And this is what we found. We found that the freshmen were one quarter of the whole amount. We were told the sophomores were one third. And we were told juniors were half of the remaining people. We were further told that we surveyed a total of 336. The question simply is how many, how many seniors how many seniors which question is how many seniors are there for which we will use the word graduating and we'll use the rigid to represent them so that we can differentiate graduating people from sophomore Let's keep going, shall we? So, simple, simple, simple question. We surveyed the entire high school and we found out the number of people we surveyed was 336 people. That's the total number of students we have in the survey. Not necessarily in the school, but in the survey. Of which we found that one quarter were freshmen, one third were sophomores, half of the remaining one were juniors. How many, how many people are there who are graduating or who are seniors? Let's keep going. Okay. So we know total is 336. I'm going to start the process right from here. So freshmen, freshmen we are told is one quarter. Let's do it out here so we have room. Freshmen we are told that they are one quarter of the total amount and the total is 336. In other words, 336 divided by 4. Let's write it like this. It's easier to deal with it. Let's divide top and bottom by 4. If we divide top, and how do we know that this number is actually divisible by 4? Do you know the trick? A number is divisible by 4 as long as its last two digits are divisible by 4. The last two digits are here, 36, and we know 36 goes into 4, and therefore 336 divisible by 4. So let's divide by 4. How many 4s in a 3? 3 has no 4s. 3 has no 4s. What happens to the 3? The 3 goes and joins this 3 and becomes a 33. And 33 has 8 4s. Eight 4s eight are 32. After we take away 32 from 33, we have a remainder of 1. What happens to that 1? That one goes and joins the 6 and becomes a 16. And 16 has 4 fours. Voila. We have 84 freshmen. Figuring out, figuring out sophomore is very simple because we have 336. 336 goes very nicely into 3. If you divide by 3, it's just going to be 112. 112. 112. Let's figure out how many juniors are there. How many juniors are there? We have 84 freshmen. 112 sophomores, and that's the 6, 9, 196, and we have three total of 336. 336 minus the freshman and the sophomore. 336 minus 200 would have been 136. We're not subtracting 200, we're only subtracting 196, so it's exactly 200. Or rather, whatever I said before. 336 minus 200 would have been 136, so it's going to be 140. That's the remaining amount, and we are told that half of the remaining students are junior, which means we have 70 juniors. Half of the remaining, remaining is 140, so 70 is a junior, 
this is junior, this is freshman, sophomore, six, six, and two. 266. There you go, we're all done. So how many seniors are there? It's simply 336 minus 236. 336 minus 266 rather. And we'll have zero. 13 minus 6 would be 7. And that's it. And I believe I did it right. 7. 70. The answer is D. We have 70 people who are graduating or people who are seniors. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Enough of that. Enough of that. Number 11. Number 11 says that A is equal to 20. We are told that B is equal to 12. We are told that C is equal to 54. The question is, how much is D? And what we are given is, what is given to us is that this ratio A to B is the same ratio as C to D. So let's see what we can do. A is 20. B is 12, C is 54, and D is what we want to find out. Let's cross multiply and figure out the X. So if we cross multiply, we're going to figure out that X is equal to, the 20 is going to come down, 12 is going to go up, so it's going to be 54 times 12, 54 times 12 over 20. Over 20, and I don't like the way it's X is written way on the top here. It looks better if it's lined up. There we go. Let's simplify, shall we? How you go by simplifying makes no difference at all. I'm just going to do whatever it comes to my mind. There is no right or wrong sequence. Just start reducing. I see 20, I see 12. Let's divide by 4. You divide by 4, 12 has 3 4s and 20 has 5 4s. And since nothing goes into 5 evenly, we're going to have to do what we can. So let's divide top and bottom by 54 by 5. We know, we know 50 has 10 5s. We know 50 has 10 5s. And then we have a remainder of 4. And that 4 needs to be divided by 5, because we are dividing by 5. Very good, that's our answer. 10 and 4 fifth times 3. Let's figure out what that is. Let's figure out what that is. What should we do? Let's do it right here. 10 and 4 fifth times 3. Are you ready? Here we go. 3 times 10 is 30, and 3 times 4 fifth is going to be 12 fifth. 12 fifth is the same as... 12 fifths is the same as 10 fifth and 2 fifth. So it's just 32. See, 12 fifth is the same as 10 fifth and 2 fifth. Just, just, and that's 2. That's 32 and 2 fifth. Or if you like, or if you like, 32 and 0.4. Well, because you can't grade in 32 and 2 fifth in the gradient section. The answer is 32.4. Now while I was doing it, while I was doing it, I realized that I did something that I typically don't do. I'm going to redo it. I'm going to tell you what I typically would have done here. Let's do it here so that we can compare the two work. But this, there's nothing here to compare because I'm simply multiplying 10, 10 and 4 fifths by 3. That's right there. But let's pick up the story. X is equal to, X is equal to 54 times 12 over 20. Now, what I'm about to tell you is not going to be anything earth shattering. But it's just something what I do usually do, so I'm going to share with you. See, when when I see when I see a ten or a hundred or a thousand, some multiple of ten, either in the numerator or denominator, you don't want to squander it. You don't want to squander it. You don't want to squander it. You want you don't want to waste it because multiplying or dividing any number by ten or a hundred or a thousand is very easy. So why waste it? I wasted it by dividing by four. I converted the twenty into a five, and I wasted the ten. I'm going to show you what I have in mind. So instead of dividing by, instead of dividing top and bottom by 4 like we did here, let's divide by 2. So we end up with 6 and a 10. So watch what happens, okay? So now all we have to figure out is 54, 54 times 6. Shall we? We know 50 times 6 is 300, and we know 4 times, 4 times 6 is 24. So it's essentially 324 divided by 10. 324 divided by 10. Of course it's going to give us 32.4, just like it did before. That's all. And I think this is a little bit less work than that one. Just a little bit, tiny bit. When did we learn? 
When did we learn the word squander? I don't know if you are keeping up with it. Like I told you, the first day of the of, of when the course when this course began, and I've been telling you over and over again that it is important, it is vital, it is absolutely crucial, it is essential that you work on your vocabulary. Otherwise, your score in the reading part would suck to high heavens, and you don't want that. Because that's what kills most people in the reading part. It's just vocabulary. That's all it is. And which and for that reason, I put together a series of vocabulary videos, about 100 of them in the series, which will help you improve your vocabulary for the SAT. And I'm trying to figure out the day when we learned about squander, so I can tell you very quickly if I can find it. If I cannot find, other oh, ago I found it as I was speaking. Day number 37. There you go. So what you want to put in the search in, in the YouTube, what you want to search put in is this thing. Just type in my name, because without my name you're going to get thousand people. Just type in Keshwani, SAT vocabulary words, day 37. The video will pop up. Learn that word and you will learn some other useful good words. Maybe some synonyms, maybe some antonyms. Number 12. Number 12 says, oh number 12 is very silly. It says convert convert 3.1 mile into kilometer. That's all. And they give us this information. One kilometer equals 0.6214 mile. This is not something this is not something we need to know ahead of time. This is not something we need to memorize. This is not something we need to know by heart. They will always give it to us. Do you understand? So let's do this. Very good. Okay? Let's do this. Enough of the talk. We are converting kilometers into miles. They set it up in a proportion. Kilometers over mile. And we are told that uh, uh, one kilometer equals this many miles. 0.6214. And the question is, how many kilometers would be 3.1 mile? That's it. Cross multiply and solve it. That's it. Simply it's just going to be 3.1 divided by this quantity. Let's do it on the top. When you cross multiply, 3.1 is going to end up on the top. So we're going to end up with x equals to 3.1 over 0 0.060214. And that is approximately equal to, that's a, that is approximately equal to 3.12, uh, 3.1 over 0.62. Are you with me? I'm going to rewrite 62, and you will see the reason why I'm going to rewrite it. 62. Point six two. What we're going to do next here, I'm showing you all the baby steps, I don't know why, there is a zero here. Of course you know why there is a zero there. Let's multiply top and bottom. Let's multiply top and bottom by 100. If we multiply top and bottom by 100, 3.1 times 100 will become 310, 310, which I'm going to write that as 31 times 10. Okay, stay with me in this story. And 0.62 times 100 is just 62. Are you with me? Let's divide top and bottom by 31. And divide top and bottom by 2. Voila. Turns out x is approximately 5. It turns out that it's approximately 5, five miles. Or 5 kilometers make 3.1 kilometers. That's all. Number 13. Number 13. In number 13, I don't know what we have, a helicopter or a drone or something. It doesn't matter at all as to what the bloody thing is. What matters to us is that we are delivering two packages. We are going to deliver two packages. Only 100 pound packages and 120 pound packages. Let's call them boxes. Because I'm too lazy to write packages, it's too, too many letters. And we are told that we must, this is a condition, that we must carry at least 10 packages each time we go out for delivery. If each time we leave the warehouse, the driver is told that he must deliver minimum of 10 packages. That's the requirement, that's the work requirement. Otherwise, don't go waste your 
with your gas and your depreciation on the car and your, and, your, and your time or salary unless you can deliver at least 10. And we are further told that the total, total weight cannot, cannot exceed 1100 pounds. Total weight cannot exceed 1100 pounds. There is a lot of writing and a lot of bullcrap here for very little excitement. You will find that in a second. It's a very straight, very simple, very straightforward problem. The question is very simple. The question is, what is the maximum number of 120 pound, 120 pound boxes that can be delivered, that can be delivered in one trip? Now, in a question like this, you might instinctively want to set this up as an equality problem. Of course, it says the weight cannot exceed 1100 pounds, uh, the sum of the two boxes has to be at least 10. You, you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could set it up as an equality, but that is going to create a hell of a lot of work, which is completely unnecessary in my opinion. Don't set it up as an equality, just try out the answer choices. Just try out the answer choices and that's what there is. So that's what I did. Let's begin. Now that we have the information, we can start. Remember, we have two boxes, the light one and the heavy one. The light one, which is 100 pound, and the heavy one, which is 120 pound. Just remember that. And the question is, what is the maximum number of boxes that we can deliver without exceeding 1100 pounds? So, if I looked at the answer choices, the answer choices are 2, 4, 5, and 6. So I started with 5. So I said, well, let's, let me start with 5. That way we have 5 of each. 5 heavy ones, 5 light ones, see what happens. So I did that. So we have 5 of the light one, 5 of the heavy one, and the light one are each 100 pounds, so that's going to give us 500 pounds. The heavy ones are each 120 pounds, that's going to give us 600 pounds. Uh, and voila, it turns out to be exactly 1100, 1,100 pounds. We are fine, we have not exceeded the weight. Then I said to myself, since Eliza, since answer choice D is 6, and since we want to deliver maximum of heavy one, this is what we want to maximize. I said to myself, what I always say to myself, I said to myself, self, why don't you try one more? Instead of 5, let's try 6. So that's what I did. So instead of 5, I tried 6. So let's do a second scenario. So if we do 6 of those, each of them, work, uh, uh, each of them carries 120 pounds, each of them weighs 120 pounds, 12 times 5 is 60, so it's going to be 720 pounds. Now if you're going to deliver 6 of those, we must deliver 4 of the light one, because that's the condition, we must deliver 10, 10 boxes. If you deliver 4 of the light one, you end up with 400 pounds, and 400 plus 720, 400 plus 720 is more than 1100. And that's not going to work. That's, that's 1120 pounds. That's not going to work. Just for the 20 pounds, we cannot deliver that heavy box. So it has to be five of each. That's all. So the maximum number of heavy boxes that can be delivered, the answer is it is five, and the answer is C. The answer is C. And that was the end of it. I did not set it up as inequality. Number 14. Make sure you work on your vocabulary. I cannot emphasize enough. And the beauty of, beauty of that is that you don't need anybody's help. You can just as well do it on your own. All that is required is that you have discipline and dedication. That's all. Number 14. So we bought something, a machine apparently, for $120,000. We are told that it has we are told that it has linear depreciation, even though that's not the term that is used in the book. In the question, I use it. Linear depreciation simply means linear simply means that the slope is constant, obviously, you know that, which simply means that the depreciation depreciation it depreciates rather, it simply means that it depreciates. by the 
same amount each year. Or put another way, the depreciation is constant. The depreciation is constant every year or it depreciates by the same amount. We are further told that the machine was worth machine was worth thirty thousand dollars thirty thousand dollars after ten years. And the question simply is how do we express this idea in the form of a of an equation? How do we express this idea in English language into the language of algebra? Let's find out, shall we? So first thing first, we know it. We started out. We bought the machine for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. In ten years' time, it is now only worth thirty thousand dollars. That tells us that it depreciated. It depreciates it. It depreciated. One hundred twenty to thirty ninety thousand dollars in ten years. That's what that tells us. And since we are told that it depreciates the same amount each year, that implies that it must depreciate nine thousand dollars per year. That's what that tells us. That's what we've done. It depreciates nine thousand dollars per year. We started out with one hundred and twenty, and what we started out with one hundred and twenty is going to be a y-intercept. It's going to be negative to slope line, obviously, because the value is going down. The value is going to be shown on x-axis. Uh, rather, the value is going to be shown on the y-axis. The time is going to be here. It's going to go down. This is the value in dollar amount, and we started with one hundred and twenty, and it goes down nine thousand each year. That's the slope. So there we go. The, lo the equation is going to be the value. Let's put down value as a function of time. Is simply going to be what we started out with, which is one hundred and twenty, which is right here, minus nine, minus. Nine times t, where t represents the time period, for year one, year two, year three. Which is why when we substitute ten here for t, nine times ten is ninety. One hundred and twenty minus ninety is thirty thousand dollars, which is the value at the end of ten years. That's the equation. I don't know if that's how they show it here, but that's close enough. The answer is B. Let's do the next one. Number fifteen. Number fifteen. How many more do we have? We have quite a few more, and I don't know how much time we have taken so far. We are told that we have a line that goes through two four and zero one. Two four and zero one. Question is, what is the equation of the line? Very simple, very straightforward question. What's the what's the equation of the line that goes through these two points? And obviously, we can very easily figure out the equation of the line because if we know the two, two points it goes through, we can figure out the slope. And once we have the slope, we can figure out the y-intercept somehow. And that's that's what we're going to use. Okay, let's begin the slope. Slope is typically the symbol that is used to represent slope is letter M, as you probably already know, which is simply the change in y over the change in x. Let's do the change in y. I'm going to start from here. So 4 minus 1, that's the change in y. And since we started from here, we have to start again from here. 4 minus 1 and over 2 minus 0. Follow. Right. 4 minus 1 is 3 over 2. And now in this format, in this format mx plus b, let's put it here, in this format mx plus b, as we both know, b represents b represents the y-intercept. b represents the y-intercept, which is the value of y, value of y when x is equal to 0. That's what y-intercept means, because y-intercept is you see, where does it cut the y-axis? The place where it cuts the y-axis, x is equal to zero. Of course you know that. I don't know why I'm doing this thing. Of course you know it. So now we have to figure out what's the value of y when x is equal to zero. It turns out that we have to do no such thing. They tell us what it is right here. They tell us what is the value of y when x is zero. When x is zero, y is one. It goes through that point. It is given. 
So that's what it is. When x is 0, y is 1, we have the slope. Therefore, the equation is going to be y is equal to, let's, let's line it up right here, y is equal to m, which is 3 halves, x plus b, which is 1. Very good, this is our equation. What's the value of y when x is equal to 0? Right here, when x is equal to 0, y is 1. It goes through that point. They tell us that. Just pick the one that matches that format. And that's, as I'm looking at it, that's the choice D. Let's move on to number 16. Number 16, the penultimate problem. We, can't, we have come across this word many a time, so I'm not going to look up as to which day we learn it. You should know this by now. Number 16, the second to the last problem in the, on, the, on the page. Let's start from the top so that we have a little bit more room. So here we are given an equation 4x plus 4 times ax minus 1 minus x squared plus 4 and actually what we are given in the problem, the way it is stated in the problem, we are not given an equation, we are given an algebraic expression. This is an algebraic equation, uh, algebraic expression. It is not an equation because the equation is so called because the bloody thing has to have an equal sign. There is no equal sign here, it is an expression. But then they go on to tell us that this expression equals, they go on to tell us in the problem that, that this expression equals b times x. I don't know why they simply did not put this in, in the form of an equation to begin with. I suppose they wanted to be cute. It says that the, if, if, the, if the expression is equivalent to bx, what's the value of b? And we are told that a and b are constant, which they always are, and the question is, what's the value of b? This is what we're looking for. Let this put, let's put it on the side so we know what we're looking for here. What is the value of b? Let's begin the show, shall we? Let's begin the show. I'm going to erase this part. Let's begin, shall we? So, 4x times ax, 4x times ax will be 4ax squared. Stay with me in the story, okay? Make sure I don't make a mistake. 4x minus negative 1 is going to be negative 4x because it is very easy to make a mistake if you're not paying attention. And 4 times 4ax minus 4 and then we have negative x squared and then we have positive 4 and that whole thing equals bx that whole thing equals bx but what that equals to we, let's not worry about it right now let's not worry about it right now okay first thing we notice is that we have a negative 4 we have a negative 4 and a positive 4 let's let's just kill the bloody thing and now let's let's put together our light terms so here we see x squared a term with the x squared here we see terms of x squared, let's put them together. So we end up with 4ax squared minus x squared, which is simply x squared, take out the x squared common, so we're going to end up with 4a minus 1. And then we see right here, so that part is done. And then we have negative 4x plus 4ax, so again, let's put them in a different form so we can see it. So here we have x and here we have x. Let's take out the x common, and as we take out the x, I'm going to take out positive x common. We end up with 4a, 4a minus 4, and that has to equal that has to equal bx, because that's what we are told. The very first thing we notice is that on this side we only have b times x. There is no term with the x squared in it. There is no term here with x squared in it, which means. This implies, this implies, this means that this quantity, 4a minus 1, must equal 0, which is why this x squared drops out. This quantity must be 0. So there we go, we can figure out the a. So, which means 4, 4a must equal 1, and that in turn implies that a must equal 1 quarter. So that part is done. Let's work on this part, shall we? Let's, let's first simplify this thing. 4a minus, the same as 4 times a minus 1. And that's the coefficient of x. That's the coefficient of a x, but we are told that it's equal to bx this side. Which means, since this is the coefficient of x here, 
which means this quantity must equal b, which is exactly what we are looking for. We are looking for the value of b, we know the value of a, we put it there, find it. 4 times a, which is 1 quarter, minus 1, which is same as 4 times 1 quarter minus 1 is same as negative 3 quarters. That's it, we are done. The 4 is going to drop out and b is simply negative 3. b is simply negative 3. As you can see, there are 4 drops out and b is equal to negative 3. And what answer choice would that be? Number 16, was it? Does answer choice b as in boy? Let's do the very last one, shall we? Enough of that. Number 17. Number 17 says, what is the value of 2w plus 3t? And they give us two equations. First equation is 2w plus 4t is equal to 14. And second equation is 4w plus 5t is equal to 25. Now listen carefully to what I have to say here, pay close attention. This kind of problem appear all the time in the exam where they do not, they're not asking us, if they give us two equations and they ask you what's the value of x or what's the value of y, of course we have to fi figure out individually uh, what the value of x and what, what the value of y is, whatever it is being asked here. But a lot of the time when they ask you something like this, how much is 2w plus 3t or how much is 4a plus 3c or how much is 5q plus minus 7, so 5, 5p minus 7q, you get the idea. Whenever they're looking for the value of an expression as opposed to just one variable, this is an expression. Whenever they're looking for the value of an expression, before you do anything at all, before you invest any time in it at all, try adding the two equations. And if that doesn't get you where you want to go, try subtracting one equation from the other. And what you'll find is that in vast majority of the cases, or at least that's what I have found, it gets me where I want to go. It gets me where, where I want to go. I will not say always, but many a time it will get you where you want to go. So that's what we're going to do here. Let's add up the two equations and see what happens. We're going to simply add up the two equations. We don't know where it's going to take us, but let's just try it and see what happens. So when we add the two equations, we end up with 6w plus 9t equals, that's a 9, that's a 3. Let's divide the entire equation by 3. Let's divide the whole thing by 3. We end up with 2w plus 3t equals 13. Voila. That was the end of that. That was the end of the page. I'll see you tomorrow. As I said before, if you wish to get hold of me, you can always send me an email at keshwaniprep at icloud.com and I'll be more than happy to do whatever it is that I can do to help you raise your score in the SAT. Not only in math part, I can help you with the vocabulary, I can help you with the grammar portion, which is the writing part. Alright? We'll pick up the story from here tomorrow. Bye now.